Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be with you on this nice, sunshiny day. I wanted to start by asking you a question. What did you want to be when you grew up? Maybe you were a little bit younger and you're still trying to figure that out. Maybe you're an adult and you are still trying to figure that out. We all, when we are younger, have this idea in our mind of what we want to be one day. And we make plans based on that. I remember when I was a, a young boy, uh, what I usually was thinking about being is something adventurous, exciting. If it wasn't completely fantastical, like a Jedi Knight, it was something a, still a little bit adventurous, but realistic, a policeman, a fireman, an astronaut. Uh, and you can actually track in my life as my ambition slowly died, as I discovered that all of these professions involved extremely hard work and study and long, long planning. So I kind of stepped down slowly until one day I told my mom, well, I would like to be a garbage man because they don't do any paperwork and they don't really have to deal with people very often. So that sounds like a good dream for me to have. Uh, but we all have these ambitions. Uh, and I, uh, I was actually talking to a middle schooler a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about this que question. And she told me that she wants to be on the Supreme Court one day. I was like, your ambitions are a little higher than mine were at your age when I was thinking about garbage men. But we all of us do this, right? And we don't just do it when we're younger. We don't just do it when we're trying to figure out who we want to be. The entire course of our lives, human beings are planners. Some of us are really good planners. Some of us are not so good planners. But we are all planners, nevertheless. We all think about what we want to do. Who do we want to marry? Where do we want to live? We fixate and focus on how we achieve these things. And this week's passage is looking at this idea of planning. As we continue reading through what James's challenges and message is for us, we come to this section where he starts talking about what it means to plan as someone who has faith. What does it mean to think through the course of your life and how to build that if you are someone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, that he did what he did, that he died and rose again for you. The whole book, he has been challenging us to think about what our faith means if it is going to be lived out day to day. We've had James challenge us about the way that we treat other people, even inside church. Do we show favoritism? Are there people that we are more prone to show grace to, show forgiveness to, show love to, show generosity to? And he's challenged us to think that if you believe what you believe about Jesus, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then you cannot have any partiality amongst you. We had very recently about the tongue, about the way that we speak, that if we love Jesus, there should be consideration in how we talk to one another. Because if we love Jesus, our words shouldn't be the kind of words that discourage, that bring death, that bring division or destruction. This whole book has been about what does it look like for you if you believe in Jesus to live your life according to his will, according to his desires. That's why James is such a great letter in the Bible because it's an encouragement to think about what Christian faith means today, right now. That's why we called the series Street Level Faith. It is about what it means when your faith changes the way that you live your life day to day. And a huge part of that, if not one of the most important parts of that, if we think about it, is the way that we plan. Is there an intentionality to how we think about our faith being lived out? Are we planning for it? So I want to think about three questions as we look at this passage. I want to think about, number one, what is your life? Number two, what is God's will? And number three, what are you boasting in? So if you will, go ahead and read with me. We are in the book of James, verses 13 through 17. This is what James tells us. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do that, this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, 
For him, it is sin. So question number one, what is your life? If I asked uh, the majority of people out there in the world to put their hand in their pocket and bring out their phone, most people these days are going to pull out a phone that has a little Apple on the back, an iPhone. The most popular smartphone. Now it is not uh, the earliest smartphone, it's not even arguably the best smartphone, but it is the one that's most easily recognized. Even those of us uh, who have no interest in computers and smartphones, they're everywhere, right? We've been talking about the app each week as we think about our stadium service. And the iPhone and a lot of kind of the smartphone revolution came out of the plans of a man called Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is one of the founders of Apple. uh, And for a very long time, he was involved with much of what has become popular technology in our world now. Uh, When he was very, very young, he worked out of his garage And he was the man with the plan. He was able to do what everybody else was doing and make it better. See, Steve Jobs wasn't the first person to invent a computer. He wasn't even a computer engineer. Steve Jobs was the guy that came and met with guys that were building these things and inventing these things and dreaming these things up. And he came up with ways to make them better, to make them marketable, and to make them popular. Steve Jobs was the man with the plan. He could dream it up. And because of Steve Jobs, we now live in a world where iPods and iPhones and iEverything are some of the most popular things out there. I know in middle school ministry, we have to talk about it a lot because it's such an ingrained part of the world that they live in. All because of the plans of one man. But there's one thing that Steve Jobs didn't plan for. There's one thing that he couldn't plan for. And that's that at the age of only 48, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And all of a sudden, his plans didn't mean anything. It doesn't matter how ambitious he was, how successful he was, how wealthy, how innovative. His plans all of a sudden couldn't help him. And he tried to make new plans, and he tried to find ways to fight this. But in the end... He was at the mercy of something completely out of his control. Steve Jobs died only a few years after that because of something that he couldn't have foreseen, something he couldn't have expected, something that he couldn't plan for. Jim starts today's passage by saying, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So church, what is your life? What are the things that you are planning for? What are the things that you are placing your confidence in? What are the goals that you are setting for your life? And most importantly, are you recognizing that you are limited? that you are finite, that there are things in this world that are far beyond your control. When James writes this, if we remember, he has been writing to a group of Christians scattered all around the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Because of persecution, the church has been scattered out of Jerusalem and is now spread all around the region. And rather than writing to a particular church, Uh, At the beginning of James's letter, he says that he's writing to the 12 tribes. It's kind of a a way of saying the the Christians scattered out there. And he starts unpacking for them what the Christian life should look like. And in this instance, that crowd of people, we can assume, have been saying something similar, if not verbatim, to what James says. Because he says, come now, you who say. Meaning that there was a group of people out there amongst these dispersed Christians, maybe a, a majority of these people, who are saying, we are going to decide our own fate, so to speak. If we go to this place, if we do this thing, then we have a winning formula for profit. That If we go do this, this is the good plan. This is the way that we should plan. And James has something to say about this. He calls these people out, and he wants to challenge the way that they are thinking. Now, it's important to note that James is not criticizing planning. Planning is not a bad thing. Planning is a very, very good thing. He's not saying, don't plan. What James is doing is he is attacking and trying to expose the motivation for their plans. 
why are they planning this way? What are they planning for? See, to James, as a Christian, there is a way to plan and there is a way that you should not plan. That's what he's getting at with these people. And James's next words reveal that there is something underlying their plans that's not good because he goes on to say that you are a mist. You appear for a little time and then you disappear. What James is saying is you need to think about your plans and you need to think about what you're saying because at the end of the day, you're not promised tomorrow. You have no idea what is coming your way and you cannot know what is coming your way. For most of us, it would only take one message, one piece of news, one thing to upset our plans and what we hope for for ourselves. We have no idea what could happen, not even tomorrow, but even today. Yet we plan and we plan and we plan under the impression and with the confidence that if we do A, B, and C, then we will always get D. Isn't that the way that we think? That if we get the right job, the right education, we connect with the right kind of people, we live in the right kind of area, then we're guaranteed to get a certain amount of security and success. What James says is, no, you're not guaranteed. You don't know. One of my favorite pastors, Matt Chandler, says, we are truly a people who are stuck in the weeds. We cannot see the grand scheme for all of the blades of grass, but God can, and God does. See, our plans can fail. When we plan on our own success and our own ambition, then we are building plans that have no guarantee of success. There is a better way to plan. King Solomon wrote a book in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. It's probably the one of the most underread books in the Bible, which is a shame because it's an absolutely fascinating book. What Ecclesiastes is really all about is about this man, King Solomon, one of the wisest, greatest kings in Israel's history. Uh, and he sets about trying to understand life. And he makes these plans. He plans to uh, investigate and, and seek out the true meaning of life, so to speak. And he has enough wealth and he has enough power and he has enough reputation to do anything he wants to do. So he is probably the most equipped man to go out on this mission of discovering what life is really all about. And he goes through some pretty crazy twists and turns as he does it. He marries hundreds of women trying to find out if there's a way he can be satisfied through relationships. He builds palaces and temples and plants hundreds of thousands of trees to try and build himself a legacy. But in the end, King Solomon comes to this conclusion. In Ecclesiastes 6, he says, Who knows what is good for a man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? Who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? In the end, the wisdom that King Solomon leaves us with is that we are limited is that we are finite. The way that he most often talks about life in this book, Ecclesiastes, is he says it's vanity. Now, I don't think that King Solomon means that to say that life is not worth living. He means it to say that there is a quality about life that is beyond our control, that no matter what we do, at the end of the day, we all share the same limitations, the same vulnerabilities. We don't know what happens tomorrow. So in light of that, what are we building our lives around as people? What are we planning for? What are the goals that we are setting? If your life is all about your plan, if it's all about the things that you have built for yourself that you are counting on, then there's a strong possibility you will be disappointed. Because in the end, James tells us that this is what our life looks like in eternity. Let's pray that it's here today and gone tomorrow. Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, Martin Luther King Jr., the most influential, the most powerful, the most successful, the most ambitious. In the end, all their life is in the scheme of eternity is a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. It's not very nice to think about, 
But James says that that's the reality. That we are smaller than we think we are. That we are far more limited than sometimes we think we are. We plan and plan and plan. We plan for our 401k and our retirement and the where we're going to live and who we're going to marry. And we think about all these details and we think if we line them up perfectly, if we can get all these details, then we will be okay if we have this, this, and this. If we think through what this group of people were saying in James, they said if we go to this place, if we do this thing, then we will get a profit. And James says, you don't know that. So the first question, what is your life? How are you building? How are you planning? The second question James brings up, I think, is what is God's will? What is God's will? And when I think about God's will, I can't help but think about my time in college. Uh, And if, if you guys remember, if you're a Christian in college, maybe it's changed for you guys, but for me, when I was in college and, and there was people becoming a Christian, the number one characteristic is that you were way overexcited. You were very zealous. You were thrilled about this new thing that you've discovered and believed. Uh, and you're trying to figure out as a young person, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And I, and I ran into very often two crowds of people who talked about God's will. The first crowd of people were boys that had fallen hopelessly in love and they thought it was God's will that they should marry a certain lady on campus. Uh, and uh, they would come and they would say, you know, I, I really think it's God's will for my life that I marry her. And what I heard them saying was, I think she's going to say no, but if I tell her God told me to, then she'll say yes. <laughs> right? It's, it's this kind of strange way of thinking about God's will. Now, the second crown of people was exactly the opposite. I had people who would come and they would talk to me about God's will and they would say, coming in heartbroken and tears on the face, she, she told me that it wasn't God's will that she'd be dating me. So she broke up with me, which is also kind of a cop-out. It's a way of saying, well, I would date you, but God said no, so (laughs) hard luck. And if we're honest, most of the time when we think about the idea of God's will and this little phrase, we are thinking of whimsical kind of specific situations like that. Who should I marry? Who should I date? Where should I get a job? Where should I live? These little details of our lives. Now, I'm not saying when I say that they're little details that they are unimportant. Of course, they're incredibly important. They make a huge difference in our lives, the decisions we make on those. But they are small in that they constitute small parts of our lives. God's will, his primary will, is actually a lot more clear than we give him credit for, that we'd like to admit. This is what James says. He says, When you plan, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. Well, what does he will? I said a moment ago that it's a lot more plain than we'd like to admit. Most of us think of God's will as this secret that if we unlock it, we'll finally be happy if we know what he wants for our life. But God has actually made a lot of what he desires, intends, and plans for our life very clear to us in scripture. We've actually been reading about a lot of it in James. When we think about God's will for our life, there is a primary part of God's will, something that takes up 99% of what he desires for us. And the Apostle Paul tells us what that is in 1 Thessalonians. When he wrote to the church there, he said, this is the will of God, your sanctification. I'm not trying to hide it there. He says exactly what it is. This is God's will. If you want to know God's will, this is it, your sanctification. Sanctification is this theological word for explaining being transformed from one thing into something that looks more like Jesus. Sanctification is about your life being changed from what it was prior to meeting Jesus into something else entirely, something better, something that looks a lot more like Jesus. That's God's will. Couldn't be plainer. The same letter of Thessalonians, only a chapter later, Paul says this. He says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Once again, not trying to hide it. This is God's will. 
that you would rejoice, that you would pray, that you would be thankful, that you would sacrifice, that you would be generous, that you would love and serve others above yourself, that you would make your life about making Jesus known. Your sanctification, your transformation. God's will for your life, if you're a Christian, is to actually be a Christian. That's not meant to be profound or clever or witty. That's just what it is. It's exactly what James has been talking about for this whole letter, that if this is what you believe, if this is who you say you are, if this is what you want to give your life to, then give your life to it. Think about how you speak, how you control your tongue. Think about how you are addressing your neighbors. Think about how you are treating other people. Think about how the different details of your life are pointing towards the God who has loved you. James is writing to Christians and he's challenging them to have real faith. Faith that has action, that is authentic. And God's primary concern isn't that we might miss the little details of our life. It's that we would focus on what is important today. Think about it this way. If we were driving in a car, any good driver knows that you need to keep your attention on the front of the road, but that you should also be aware of what is happening in the peripherals, in the corners of your eye. You should be aware of it. But your focus, your attention needs to be forward. Now, I'm admittedly not a great driver because I'm too nosy. So if I drive past something that's happening over here, I'm like this. And the car usually starts drifting really quickly. Now, if we live our life in that same way, the same way that I can drive sometimes, if, if I put my attention on peripheral things, secondary things, what about this God? What about this God? What about this God? The things that he has not made clear that are only in the corner of my eye, then I'll start to drift. And I might even crash. But if my attention is forward, if my attention is what is on primary, what is clear, what is abundantly clear in Scripture, then I will always be moving forward. And what's more, those peripheral things might end up coming into my primary field of vision. If I stay on the road and I focus on what's ahead of me, as I move forward and the road brings me to where it will, where God guides me where he will, some of those things will become clear. See, in the end, not only is most of God's will plain, if you focus on what you do know, what you don't will become clear. If you worry about today instead of tomorrow, then you've got a plan that will lead you true and straight. Here's my question for you. Do you spend more time thinking about what's happening over here in the peripherals, in the corners, the small details, or do you think about the challenges that are in front of you, the way you speak, the way that you talk to your neighbors, the way that you let your life impact, or your faith impact your life today, this afternoon, what's happening right now? If you keep your eyes ahead, and I promise you, God's will will be plain for you. Here's what I think the problem is for James's readers. I think that they were spending so much time thinking about things that were outside of their control and not enough about what was happening right now. This is why James spends this letter unpacking these different ways that they need to live their faith out. They weren't thinking about God's desire to change the way that they were living right now. This is what Jesus said in John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It's a pretty shocking statement when you think about the fact that Jesus is God. That he is the only one who really is entitled to do as he pleases, to plan however he wants to plan. And what he said was, as a model for us, as a, a grace to us, I'm going to show you that it is better to submit yourself to the will of your Father who loves you. To move your hopes and dreams 
and sources of security for yourself to the side and say, I choose God, my Father, as my source of security, as the rock on which I'm building my plans. Not to plan around what your definition of success and happiness is, but to plan around God's. To love Him above all else, to love others more than yourself, to give yourself your time, your resources, your energy for the sake of others. That's the best way to think about God's will for your life. And here's how you can start doing that. You can start thinking more about what God has called you to do in the present than in the future. A lot of people in the Bible prayed about God's will, but most often they went praying to know it. If not all the time they went praying to know it, they were praying for the courage to do it, to live it out. Stop counting on your ability to do something in the future and thinking about how you can do it now. Stop planning that if you get A, B, and C lined up, then one day you can have D. And start thinking about how can you love and serve in the present. And another saying of Jesus, he says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has its own problems. Think about today because your heavenly father knows what you need. whole letter James is pushing them to live out what they already know and the same is true with God's will live out what God has already made plain last question that pops up in this passage what are you boasting in what are you boasting in James says in the close of this as it is you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him it is sin James is wrapping up his challenge by helping them see that if they are to plan on doing these certain things without thinking about what God's will might for, for them might be, then really they're boasting in their arrogance. And here's why, is that this group of people have said, if we go to this place at this time, then we'll get this. They are presuming on the time to do it, they're presuming on the good fortune to do it. They're presuming on the resources to do it. They are presuming on a lot that they don't have control over. That's what arrogance is. He's not saying this to condemn them. He's not saying this to shame them. He's saying it to expose the frailty of their plans and to offer them something better. That's grace. That's James's love for the church, for people, that they would build their lives not on something that is unpredictable and dangerous, but on something that is sure and good. The flaw that these men and women were making is that they were forgetting that this is what their life is. They were forgetting that they were a mess. They were forgetting their limitations. God's grace is continually towards us. His love, his goodness, and that includes in our plans. So that means sometimes he's gonna push back on them, he's gonna upset them, he's gonna help us change them. Most of the time we ask God to bless our plans, but he wants to be the center of them. He's a good question to ask. If your plan had to change today, if some of the details of it got moved around, how would that affect you? How would that impact you? If you got some bad news today and you couldn't keep following the trajectory you had planned for yourself, how would that impact your life? If the answer is that it would cripple you, that it would be unbearable, then perhaps you have built your life on a plan that is not good for you. On the other hand, if you could say, well, that would be hard, but in the end, I know I would be okay, then your plan is probably built on God. If no matter what happens tomorrow, in the end, you know you have the security of the love of your heavenly Father, that he will take care of you, then your plans are free to be whatever they need to be. That's why he's not attacking planning in general. He's just saying, think about how you are planning Paul is famous for having said in Philippians, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
And then in Romans, he says, if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. See, for Paul, it didn't matter what happened tomorrow. He knew he would be okay. Whether he lived or whether he died, he had confidence, he had hope. It's not because Paul was naive. It's not because he was stupid. It's because Paul knew his Savior. Paul knew his Heavenly Father. He knew that no matter what his plans were, if he had him, he was okay. This past week, some of you know that Chapel Street suffered a tremendous loss. It was a, a dear loved, dearly loved member of our family, of our staff called John Harper, who very, very suddenly passed away as a result of a stroke. He was very young. And in a lot of ways, I think he was the, the secret backbone of this church because he helped us all stand taller Job's, John's job was to make sure that the rest of us are okay, that we're doing a good job, that Andrew's middle school slip and slides are not causing anything to fall down or get anyone hurt. And this week, reading this passage, reading about what it says about our lives, could not have been more real to us as a staff, as a church family seeing that someone we loved so much was here today and gone. But as I have considered what James' words mean for us, I am reminded that John Harper is really an example to all of us of what James is trying to make of us, what he is telling us that God wants to make of us. Because G John's plan was not built on something in the future, it was built on Jesus. This is how I know this. John was integral in planning our upcoming stadium service. He would be the guy that was making sure that this thing is going to run smoothly. He met with staff at the Cougar Stadium. He worked with all of our departments here at the church so that we could put on a stadium service that blows people away and shows people who Jesus is. And he would meet with some of the staff at Cougar Stadium to get all these plans together. And really, the purpose of these meetings primarily was administrative details, making sure that everything was coming together the way it was supposed to. But we were told after John's death by uh, a member of the staff at Cougar Stadium, who's a member of this church as well, that when he would meet with John, John would want to pray. And John prayed for the stadium service that people would know Jesus that this wouldn't be about putting on a good show. It would be about people knowing Jesus. That's who John was. And he didn't stand behind a pulpit. He wasn't the most visible of men, but he loved Jesus. You will hear that from everyone who knew him. Everything he did, you could smell and taste Jesus in it. He considered his life an opportunity to glorify God, to do his will, to love others and serve others. When I think about street level faith, when I think about what authentic Christian living looks like, I think of John Harper. And I can't help but think of the sovereignty of God over this message as it was being planned, as it was being read by our church family, and this event happens. Right? If James's challenge to these people was to help them not be these planners that built their life on things not promised, then John is the example of what James is trying to create in us, trying to encourage us to be. People who live for today, and whether no matter what happens tomorrow, we have Jesus. We have a God who loves us, who's working in us, through us, for us. John boasted not in his plan for tomorrow, but in Jesus. And that's what planning with the Lord looks like. And those plans do not fail. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for this challenge in James to live out authentic faith to be a people who build our plans not 
on some winning formula that we have concocted, but on your grace and your mercy, your love for us. May we be like our brother John. May we be like Jesus. People who do not do our own will, but the will of our Father who loves us. May we be a people who looks to what you have made plain. And may we have the courage to do it. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.